हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू ए पी जी पाठशाला आई एम रविंद्र कुमार पाठक असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर एट नेशनल यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ स्टडी एंड रिसर्च इन लॉ एट रांची टूडे द मॉडल वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस इज फिलोसफी ऑफ पनिशमेंट एंड हेयर वी विल डिस्कस अबाउट द डिफरेंट फिलोसफीज रिलेटिंग टू पनिशमेंट नाउ वी विल फोकस अपॉन द लर्निंग आउटकम्स द लर्निंग आउटकम्स दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डील विथ इज understanding the following the first one is to understand the uh, difference uh, between punishment and penalty the second learning outcome is to explore the meaning of punishment to figure out the aims of punishment to appreciate the philosophy of punishment and if we put it uh, very briefly then we will try to uh, briefly try to understand the theories of punishment and uh, therefore we start with the introduction part generally speaking uh, just as a crime is the violation of uh, juridical order so punishment is restoration of the juridical order which has been violated and consequently the restoration of the peace which has been disturbed whereby human society is uh, made possible crime and punishment are inseparable and punishment enables us to understand the crime and crime enables us to understand the punishment punishment um, is the correlative of crime and the and punishment both in the abstract and concretely is naturally determined by the crime however when it comes to defining punishment it becomes a difficult exercise the reason being it is conceptually fuzzy it does not have a fixed connotation it is susceptible of both a wider and a narrower meaning and therefore at different times legal scholars have tried to draw the conceptual contours of punishment giving rise to a rich literature that abounds in rival op opinions about different aspects of punishment now we'll go uh, now we will uh, discuss about the difference between punishment and penalty in common parlance sometimes the words punishment and penalty are used in similar vein however it is notable that the expression penalty is an elastic term with many different shades of meaning but it is it it always involves an idea of uh, punishment which is a universal response to crime and deviance in all societies there are certain practices which will which will not strictly be punishment but which would fall within the meaning of penalties there are certain sanctions which are merely penalties such as parking tickets taxes football penalties and therefore to exclude them uh, from the class of dealings properly called punishment Joel Fenberg suggested that the proper punishment unlike mere penalties uh, express resentment disapproval condemnation and reprobation now we'll try to discuss the meaning of punishment it is said that legal boundaries of punishment are elusive if we look at some of the oft quoted and widely discussed definitions of punishment it helps us to draw the broad contours of punishment and allows us to develop an understanding of what constitutes punishment and more importantly what is not punishment hobbes defined punishment as an evil inflicted by public authority on the person who has been judged by the same authority as a transgressor of law so that the will of man may be disposed to obedience he believed that punishment disposes the delinquent or by his example other man to obey the law later on now we will try to see uh, hobbes definition of punishment now we will try to see how bentham defined bentham defined punishment as an evil resulting to an individual from direct intention of another on account of some act that appears to have been done or omitted it is an evil a physical evil either a pain or a loss of pleasure in recent times 
Hall defined punishment thus. He said that punishment is a, depri is a privation, a will, pain, disvalue, it is coercive, it is inflicted in the name of the state, it is authorized. Punishment, he said, presupposes rules, the violations and more or less moral determination of that expressed in a judgment. It is inflicted upon an offender who has committed a harm and this presupposes a set of values by reference to which the harm and the punishment are ethically significant. The extent or type of punishment is in some defended way related to the commission of the harm and uh, aggravated or mitigated by reference to the personality of the offender, his motive and temptation. Now, we will try to see the how Hall characterizes punishment, the characteristics of punishment as Hall's, Hall puts it. According to Hall, punishment is the public realistic condemnation of harmful, immoral, legally forbidden conduct. It is an implication of the basic principles of the moral life. Those principles could not survive the demise of just punishment. Be that as it may, the most acceptable basic premise is that punishment is suffering or pain often in the form of deprivation imposed on a person by a legal authority in response to an action C committed or failed to commit. However, defining punishment in terms of pain and suffering does have its own shortcomings. Namely, how do we decide what counts as suffering or pain? Should we change the punishment given to a particular offender based on how she experiences pain or suffering given her uh, unique personal characteristics and circumstances? Or should it be one size fits all? Julian Alexander rightly summarizes the definitional predicament thus. He says that a modern legal definition of punishment is pain, suffering, loss, uh, confinement or other penalty inflicted on a person for an offence by the authority to which the offender is subject. Such definition is not satisfying in a discussion as to the reason and theory of punishment and exhibits the usual defects of a definition in terms of uh, effects and incidents to the exclusion of causes and purposes. Therefore, given the complexity that entails any exercise aimed at defining punishment, we need a functional definition. And according to Packer, the starting point towards finding such a definition would be Herbert Hart's widely remembered essay on Prolegomenon to the principles of punishment in his celebrated work namely known as punishment and responsibility, Hart defines punishment in terms of five elements. Thus, first it invokes pain and other consequences normally considered unpleasant. Second, it must be inflicted for an offence against legal rules. Third, it must be of an actual or supposed offender for his offence. Fourth, it must be intentionally administered by human beings other than the offender. It must be imposed and administered by an authority constituted by the legal system against which the offence was committed. Now, we will try to see the characteristics of punishment by H. L. A. Hart as he has explained. Now, according to Macpherson, Hart's five-point formulation fits the retributive view much more easily than it does the deterrent or the reformative views. The probable reason being that what the retributive views view really does is to give the definition of punishment whereas the other standard theories give its justification. Hart's definition is similar to Flew's definition of punishment. Flew said that any treatment given by one person to another would fall within the meaning of punishment if it fulfills five conditions which require that it should be a hard 
treatment inflict treatment inflicted for a violation of legal rules on the actual or supposed violator and imposed and administered by human beings other than the supposed violator himself who has the authority to do so under the rule of the governing legal, legal system. Even Hart's simple and lucid five-point characterization of punishment has invited criticisms in plenty, notably whereas the last two elements are designed to differentiate between legal punishment from inflicted from punishment inflicted by other human or divine agencies and are therefore not objectionable the first three elements are open to criticism macpherson summarizes the unsatisfactory aspect of hart's definition thus according to him there is an ambiguity in involved and considered in the sentence which reads like it must involve pain or other consequences normally considered unpleasant. This may refer either to the intention of the punisher or to the experience of the punished. Some people prefer being in prison to being outside. The rich do not feel a small fines. Does this, uh, does this mean that the imprisonment or fines in these cases are not punishment? Hart says that it must be for an offense against legal rules. And again, it must be imposed and administered by an authority constituted by a legal system. This implies that, for example, offenses against moral as opposed to legal rules or against uh, parental injunctions cannot be punished or can be punished only in a secondary sense of punishment. Hart himself does indeed describe the latter of these cases as substandard or secondary heart says it must be intentionally administered by human beings other than the offender no unintentional punishment then no punishment by fate no divine punishment no self punishment but this is to discourage at the outset the raising of what may be substantial issue it is it is to relegate to the realm of substandard what are surely quite common uses of punishment, examination of which might throw light on the general concept of punishment if there is one. Now according to Packer, the five characteristics of punishment in Hart's version need to have a sixth characteristic that is it must be imposed for the dominant purpose of preventing offenses against uh, legal rules or of exacting retribution from offenders or both. Such an addition will serve to make an intelligible distinction between punishment and other sanctions used in the legal system. There are certain kinds of conduct that warrant criminal punishment. Such a conduct may include a conduct which is viewed immoral without significant social dissent. And subjecting such a conduct to criminal sanction is not inconsistent with the goals of punishment. Moreover, suppressing such a conduct will not inhibit socially desirable conduct and can be dealt with without discrimination. Most importantly, controlling such a conduct through criminal process should not cause a strain in the process. Either qualitatively or quantitatively. Lastly, there should not be any reasonable alternatives to the criminal sanctions. Now, we try to see the aims of punishment. If we look at the various theories of punishment and philosophical discussions as to the justification and content of punishment, it becomes apparent that there are certain ends that are achieved or may be achieved through the infliction of punishment. However, the very idea of infliction needs to be seen from the perspective of how far it is able to serve the purpose it is supposed to fulfill. There can be many a reason that justifies one or other form of punishments to be inflicted. The aims of punishment may be summarized therefore thus. 
that is that the prevention of crime may be by way of uh, deterrence, reformation, rehabilitation, to maintain the obligatory status of law, to reinforce collective values, to eliminate threats to the prevailing social order, the protection of the community through the physical incapacitation of the convicted offenders. Now, when we look at the aims of punishment, according to Packer, punishment has two justifying aims. First, prevention of undesired conduct and the second, retribution of perceived wrongdoing. However, he does point out that the criminal sanction is the best available device we have for the dealing with uh, the gross and immediate harms and threats to harm. It becomes less useful as the harm becomes less gray, gross and immediate. It becomes largely inefficacious when it is used to enforce morality rather than to deal with the conduct that is generally seen as harmful. According to him, besides the prevention of crime, one of the ultimate purposes to be served by criminal punishment is the deserved infliction of suffering and uh, uh, on evil, evil doers. Now, philosophy of punishment, when we talk about it, there are certain philosophical justifications of punishment which have over the years come to be known by different names and these philosophical justifications form the basis of many a theory of punishment. Kant said, Punishment in general is physical evil accruing from moral evil. It is either deterrent or else retributive. Punishments are deterrent if their sole purpose is to prevent an evil from arising. They are retributive when they are imposed because an evil has been done. Punishment are therefore a means of preventing an evil or of punishing it. Those imposed by governments are always deterrent. They are meant to deter the sinner himself or deter others by making an example of him." Unquote. To this we can aid two other philosophical justifications, namely preventive and reformative. Besides, we may well have contribution of Hindu jurisprudence in this respect in the form of expiatory theory. Therefore, different philosophical understandings and justifications of punishment can be studied under five broad categories. It is important to note that we find description of different theories of punishment mentioned ever in Dand Viveka, a medieval Sanskrit treatise on Hindu criminal law. The theories followed in the treatise and reminiscent of the modern theories of punishment are preventive or deterrent theory, retributive theory and reformative theory. Preventive of deterrent theory is manifest in death punishment while banishment and mutilation of the offending organ of the culprit, fine, forfeiture of property and exacting compensation are instances of the retributive kind. Now, detention of the culprit in jail or in solitary cell for correction and repentance of the wrongdoer are the two methods of reforming and reclaiming him as a useful member of the society. Now, we will try to see uh, and try to understand uh, what is retributive theory. Retribution basically means that the wrongdoer pays for his wrongdoing. The suffering that he undergoes restores the balance which his original crime disturbed. This notion is clearly connected with that of revenge. Retribution might be thought of as an extension of this society itself feeling sympathy for with the victim and sharing his desire for vengeance. But when, when revenge gives way to retribution, the emphasis is in no longer on assuaging the victim's feeling, but in seeing that the wrongdoer gets his deserts. Joel Mayer pertinently reminds that the instinctive reaction to criminal act is retaliation by the injured person. It is vengeance, a, a, a way of realizing and expressing hostility towards the criminal and his conduct. Primitive 
man following his basic instinct of self-preservation and retaliated against those who injured him or his position. Retaliation by the victim was immediate and savage. He demanded punishment in kind and the inner peace of the victim was not restored until the wrongdoer had been made to suffer. That is, it was considered just if the injured person took revenge on the person causing injury. An eye for eye and a tooth for a tooth, a formulation we find in Hamburavi's quote, gained accept acceptance, giving rise to a debated principle criminal deserves to suffer, as Salman observes, conception of retributive justice still retains a prominent place in our popular thought. It flourishes also in the writings of the theologians and of those imbued with theological modes of thought and even among philosophers, it does not lack advocates. Kant, for example, expresses the opinion that punishment cannot rightly be inflicted for the sake of any benefit to be derived from it either by the criminal himself or by the society and that the sole and the sufficient reason and justification of it lies in the fact that the evil has been done by him who suffers it. Now we will try to see in brief what is deterrent theory. According to this theory, the purpose behind punishment should be to deter the prospective criminals. An offender is punished to be set as an example so that the prospective offenders may see the consequences and they may have to face that they may have to face. In other words, deterrence is the use of punishment to prevent the offender from repenting his offense and to demonstrate to other potential offenders that what will happen to them if any, if, if any of them follows the wrongdoer's example. It is notable that the deterrence is used in two senses. First, punishment of an offender will deter others from committing the crime for which he or she was convicted. Second, it will deter the person found guilty of an offense from committing further crimes. Bernard J. said to a prisoner, Thou art to be hanged, not for having a stolen a horse, but in order that other horses may not be stolen. Now, we will try to see what preventive theory is all about. One of the primary aims of punishment is prevention of crime by disabling the offender from repeating the crime by way of punishment in the form of death, exile, incapacitation and so on. Development of prison system was an offshoot of this preventive philosophy in that through incarceration and imprisonment offenders could be eliminated from the society. They could thus be prevented and disabled from committing crimes repeatedly. Imprisonment therefore serves both preventive as well as deterrent function. According to Justice Holmes, there can be no case in which the lawmaker makes certain conduct criminal without thereby showing a wish and a promise to prevent that conduct. Prevention accordingly would seem to be the chief and the only universal purpose of punishment. The law uh, threatens certain pain if you do certain things intending thereby to give you motive for not doing them. If you persist in doing them, it has to inflict pains in order that its threats may continue to be believed. Now we will see what is reformative theory. According to this theory, the primary aim of punishment should be to reform the criminal and therefore punishment should look to the future and not to the past. Corporal punishment should be avoided and by adopting reformative approaches or measures, an offender should be rehabilitated 
to be a law abiding citizens in India. One of the foremost advocates of reformative theory has been Justice V. R. Krishnaya, who through his judgments infused elements of humanism and spirit of reform into prison jurisprudence in India. It is said that reformative approach to punishment should be the object of criminal law in order to promote rehabilitation without offending the community conscience and to secure social justice. Justice Katie Thomas in State of Gujarat versus Honorable High Court of Gujarat put forth the changing paradigm as regards the practice of punishment. He said, quote, among the conflicting theories for punishment, modern criminologists are highlighting the reformative effect on the punished criminals as the most germane aspect. The retributive theory of punishment has waned into relic of primitivity because civilized society has realized the retribution cannot solve the problem of escalating criminal offenses. Crime is now considered to be a problem of social hygiene. The emphasis involved in punishment has now been transposed, transposed from the retribution to cure and uh, reform so that the original man who has mentally who was mentally healthy can be in, recreated from the ailing criminal. Unquote. Now we'll see expiation theory, well known to Hindu jurisprudence. Expiatory theory in modern times has found acceptance, though in a modified form, among the jurists and philosophers and is treated under the rubric of retributive theory. Therefore, it may be seen as closely related to retributive theory, uh, though expiation differs from retribution in the sense that when an offender transgresses law, he or she incurs a debt and justice requires that the debt be paid and the wrong be expiated. When the offender undergoes the punishment, the debt is paid. For example, in the US, expiation was one of the reasons that capital punishment was imposed in the 17th and in the 18th centuries. Now, criminals were sometimes moved to confess to capital crime so that they could in that way pay their moral debts with their blood. In ancient Hindu period, punishment was considered to be a sort of expiation which removed impurities from the man of sinful promptings and reformed his character. Now, we will come to the summary of all that we have discussed so far. It is a difficult task to define punishment. It is a fuzzy concept as it lacks fixed connotations giving rise to both a narrower and wider meaning. As scholars like Bentham, Hall, Hart have tried to define punishment in different ways. As regard the aims of punishment, it mainly includes prevention of crime by way of deterrence, reformation, rehabilitation to maintain the obligatory status of law to reinforce collective values, to eliminate threats to the prevailing social order and the protection of the community uh, through the physical incapacitation of convicted offenders. Over the years, view, few theories have come into existence to delineate the various aspects of punishment, namely preventive or deterrent theory, retributive theory and reformative uh, theory. Now, with this we come to the end of this module. Uh, thank you very much for watching this video.